morning, good evening, good afternoon, and hello to everyone. Welcome to this technical webinar on greening the recovery post COVID-19. I'm Jen from the IGF team at the AFI Management Unit, and I'll be your MC for this event. Hope you're all seated comfortably and ready to listen to this interesting topic. So to start the conversation, we now ask the new IGF Working Group Chair, Ms. Audrey Hobb from the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe to formally welcome everyone to this event. The floor is yours, Audrey. Uh, thank you very much, Jen. Um, it's a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all, depending on your time zones. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on greening the recovery post COVID-19. I trust that we are all ready to learn, uh, participate, and even share our own experiences when we are given the opportunity to do that. Let's feel free to ask questions where they, they arise. I'm sure there's a chat box where you can actually throw in your questions. As I find this to be important and is for the betterment of our financial inclusion initiatives in our own countries. Uh, to the speakers, I would like to thank you for your availability. We look forward to hearing from you as we further our capacity building initiatives. To the AFI management team, we appreciate your effort in putting this program together and we are ready to learn. I wish everyone a fruitful webinar and welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Audrey, for that very short but very sweet and warm welcome to everyone in this webinar. And so from the uh, uh, office side, we call on the head of the Inclusive Green Finance, uh, Ms. Johanna Neiman. Thank you so much, Jen. And, uh, and thank you, uh, Audrey. Uh, they are working group members and other members taking part in this webinar, their panelists and, and their colleagues. It's really a great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's webinar. Um, the times we're living and what we're seeing, they are indeed uh, unprecedented. The ongoing global pandemic, it's affecting all of us and it's having severe impact on our financial systems. Um, I'm sure you all follow the IMF projections coming out earlier in October, predicting a minus 4.4% global growth, growth during 2020, which is indeed less than, uh, than what was projected in June. Uh, it is still though, a very bleak picture. And what has been documented now in the past months of the pandemic is that those at the base of the economic pyramid are those most severely impacted both when it comes to the health crisis, but also economically speaking. There are rising numbers of unemployment and the poverty levels are increasing. The people hardest hit by the impact of the pandemic at the base of the economic pyramid, they are also disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change. So today's webinar, we will be exploring how to ensure that the recovery after and beyond COVID-19 can not only recover the economy to what it was before, but also ensure this recovery is green. Medium and long-term responses towards economic recovery, they provide an unprecedented opportunity for financial policymakers and regulators to adopt green approaches for a green and climate change resilient future. And uh, specifically important when it comes to inclusive green finance policies, policies that are targeted at the base of the economic pyramid and those that are the most vulnerable to empower them through financial inclusion to both build their own resilience to climate change, but also reduce their potential negative impacts on the environment. There are several inclusive green finance policies which can be used when designing the green interventions in relation to a COVID-19 recovery. And especially when it comes to in initiatives aimed at supporting MSMEs, the greening and resilience building potential is very convincing and I dare say a win-win. I'm very happy to explore this more in depth with you here today. Uh, this is an ongoing global crisis and it demonstrates that it's more important than ever to prepare for future crises and risks, such as those posed by climate change as well. 
And this can be done by investing in a low carbon economy and investing in those that are the most vulnerable. Intensified efforts to advance financial inclusion, as well as green investments, they are crucial pillar of this resilience building. I want to thank you for joining us here today. And I'm very much looking forward to discuss and to learn from, from both concrete examples where regulators are ensuring that the recovery is both green and inclusive and to hear about other plans and ideas uh, on how to progress this green recovery post and beyond COVID-19. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Johanna, for the very informative and uh, insightful uh, remarks. And it's, uh, we go to the next one. And thank you very much uh, again. And to set the context of this webinar, we're happy to have with us today, uh, Miss, uh, we're happy to have with us today, Central Bank of Egypt's Regulations Sector General Department Head under the Banking Supervision, Miss Marwa Elosari, who will uh, please join me in welcoming Marwa. Hello, good morning, you. good evening, good afternoon. Shall I proceed, Jana? Do you, do you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you uh, all for having me um, in this important uh, webinar. Uh, really happy to share the experience of the Central Bank of Egypt regarding uh, COVID-19 measures. Uh, but first, I'd like to share with you um, a, a small story uh, about myself. Um, I wonder why I, I do love my work, uh, though it's, um, it's very stressful, exhausting, and draining me. Um, this is really because it serves people and improves the financial health of, of the, 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 the citizens and the, um, improve the economic um, conditions. Uh, that's why uh, the Central Bank of Egypt is actually developing the policies considering um, uh, the whole ESG um, uh, 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 elements and aspects. And let me uh, let me just the, um, uh, begin with the uh, uh, how how we develop the policies in the Central Bank. Um, we first aligning with the Egypt Egypt's budget 2030, which considers sustainability with uh, um, the whole aspect, the whole goals as a base of the development of this uh, region. Central Bank now, Central Bank of Egypt now is uh, in the process of developing the roadmap uh, and regulations uh, that uh, target the uh, sustainable uh, finance to the banking sector. There were actually a lot of initiatives have been introduced to the market by the Central Bank with the close coordination um, uh, with the government. Uh, to enhance and promoting sustainable finance initiatives on uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises, mortgage loans to low and mid middle middle income people. Um, let me just tell you more about what happens during the pandemic, uh, the, the 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 event that we weren't uh, um, uh, prepared for. To be honest, um, I believe in Egypt and um, in every corner of the around the globe. We weren't uh, prepared that much to, to, to manage the, 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 this, the, this level of crisis. In view of recent global development following the um, COVID-19 outbreak um, and with the aim um, of sustaining the achievement of the economic reform program that happened in Egypt taking place um, since uh, the, the previous years, Proactive decisions was introduced to support the national economic activities with uh, all its sectors disrupted by the outbreak. On the social aspect, the Central Bank of Egypt actually reduced the policy rate by, <clears throat> by 300 basis points in response to the pandemic. And um, since, uh, since then, reduced the policy rate again uh, by an additional 50 basis points. Uh, and this was actually the main purpose uh, behind this. Uh, is this was to ensure the sustainability of all economic uh, sectors, um, especially those um, which are uh, affected heavily. Um, that's why the Central Bank of Egypt uh, 
uh, proposed the, uh, some initiatives with the preferential interest rates that have been reduced uh, from 10% to 8% on loans to tourism, agriculture, industry, and construction sectors, as well as of a housing, for, uh, uh, a housing initiative for low income and middle income families. Along with that, the government guarantee uh, of the 3 billion Egyptian pounds uh, on low interest loan by the central bank has been announced for the tourism industry soft loans that targets the, uh, um, uh, the employees, um, employees payments uh, to this important sector with, which is heavily affected by the pandemic. A new housing initiative actually had been announced to provide low cost financing for housing uh, units. Along with that, uh, um, defer deferring all customers the credit used for corporates, individuals, and micro, small, and me medium enterprises had been introduced to the market. The central bank also approved the 100 billion Egyptian pounds guarantee to cover lending at preferential interest rates to the agriculture and manufacturing contract uh, loans. For the sake of keeping clients and employees in the banking sector healthy, the Central Bank of Egypt, along with the... Uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, the Central Bank of Egypt has set measures to limit cash transactions and facilitate the usage of electronic payment methods initiatives on for non-performing loans and um, on for individuals, companies for all sectors, especially tourism, were introduced along with that. On the governance the, um, aspect, the, um, the Central Bank of Egypt has issued the, um, a, uh, uh, a circular that's uh, uh, promoting participation in banks' board meetings via video or tele conferences during the 2020 and this this would be even uh, extended for um, more than uh, I believe uh, for the next uh, uh, three months on the environmental aspect actually the government of Egypt has a um, has launched a lot of initiatives even before the pandemic and they continued uh, to um, to launch more uh, on the, the green finance um, and the, with the ally, aligning with the Egyptian government initiatives, for example, on replacing uh, an old and poorly maintained vehicles and transforming vehicles from the fuel to natural gas. A new lending initiative has been introduced by the Central Bank of Egypt with a soft loan at zero to low interest rates from banks which aimed at replacing all cars with natural gas power, <coughs> powered vehicles. Um, and we all know that car pollution is one of the major uh, causes of global warm, warming, uh, warming uh, uh, phenomenon. On another note, actually the, minister, the Ministry of the Finance in coordination with the Central Bank of Egypt and other relevant ministries succeeded to issue the uh, middle um, the first middle east and north uh, african sovereign green bonds um which was uh, uh, 70 700 uh, 750 uh, thousand um, uh, sorry million us dollars and they surprisingly the issue was more than five times oversubscribed the revenue of the bond uh, will be used for financing green projects and achieving sustainable development in the field of the, uh, clean transport and renewable energy. Um, along with that, and pre the COVID-19, uh, actually uh, pandemic, um, the Central Bank of Egypt uh, introduced the, um, a lot of initiatives um, uh, related to uh, promoting the um, uh, uh, finance for the uh, clean energy and the renewable energy um, field. Um, to conclude, um, uh, funding of the crisis wasn't an easy job. We still in the middle of the crisis, um, Central Bank of Egypt and, and, and the Egyptian government have been taking effective measures, um, in my belief, 
uh, on different angles, um, measures on monetary uh, uh, monetary policies uh, through increasing money supply and reducing interest rates, launching the initiatives to keep business afloat in a harsh times, and promoting employment and economic activities, considering customers and protecting them from the economic uh, headwinds. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for um, for this uh, important webinar. And uh, I hope uh, my colleague in, um, uh, and the panelists in the AFI management unit is the, um, safe and sound. Um, uh, I'm really happy to share the Egyptian experience um, regarding the COVID uh, measures. Uh, and thank you very much. Back to you, Janet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marwa, again, for joining us and for uh, sharing uh, the Egyptian green initiatives and uh, response to this global pandemic, which actually perfectly sets the context of this event. And so before we proceed to the uh, main part of this e event, let's do a quick quiz. So just to warm up for the next session. So we ask everyone to please log into www.menti.com and use the code 4504513. Okay, www.menti.com and then use 4504513. Okay, are we all in the mentee now? Okay, the code is 4504513. Okay. Uh, can everyone see the screen? Screen? Are you all in Menti? Okay. most frequently when working at home? Okay. 
Okay. Votes are coming up. Ha, huh. so 40, 50% mostly are working in the living room. Okay, and both still keeps on coming up. Okay, that's interesting. So majority works in the living room. bonus question what would be the first thing you'd like to do after this pandemic i see already the answers here anyone still who wants to add an answer of course everybody wants to travel okay so thank you very much for uh for your participation And now we're off to the main part of this event, which will be a panel discussion. So in this session, we'll have a glimpse of an actual examples of a COVID-19 policy responses and initiatives that are geared towards green recovery and provides insights on how to green the post COVID-19 recovery. Uh, in the context setting, Marwa has already given us a glimpse of uh, what has been done in the Egyptian context. And in this session, we'll get to learn more. So this session will be moderated by Laura Ramos, Office Policy Manager for Inclusive Green Finance. So I'll pass it on to Laura. Thank you very much, Jane. Good day, distinguished members and colleagues. I'm um, very pleased to welcome you again to this Inclusive Green Finance Working Group technical webinar. And yes, as you heard before, today we are here to discuss and reflect on the possibilities and challenges on how regulators and policymakers could green the post-COVID-19 recovery. Financial sector has been instrumental in orchestrating financial packages to mitigate and reduce financial crisis that all governments are currently facing. Those financial regulators and policymakers play a relevant role in taking this recovery post COVID-19 beyond to ensure that implemented policies positively affect climate change, green finance and sustainable development. Now, we need to think what kind of interventions will be needed to strengthen resilience and reduce the current negative impact of climate change linked to the COVID-19 responses. Therefore, inclusive green finance can play a key role in catalyzing 
financial services for climate action from the private sector for a green and sustainable global recovery since they strengthen the resilience of finan financial inclusion that are providing financial inclusion solutions amidst the global financial crisis. Today, we have a very interesting policies to be presented and brilliant speakers too. I hope that you will enjoy this conversation and find it useful. Firstly, uh, allow me to introduce uh, allow me to introduce you, Mr. Joseph Sahar. Joseph is a co-founder of Earthwake, a winner of the Spring 2020 International Climate Financial Accelerator cohort in Luxembourg. He is working on the development of innovative regional mm -hmm. green financial structures, integrate and blended finance to support the transition to vulnerable communities to sustainable green practices. As an affiliated research for Stockholm Environment Institute, he is advising on the climate financial strategy for Asia Pacific and its, sorry, and its implementation. Joseph has a background in financial markets and corporate finance and has served in a variety of senior roles in international financial institutions in London, New York, and Geneva. Over the past 10 years, he has been working in Asia Pacific on climate finance for various development partners and the UN, ensuring that vulnerable communities have access to much needed finance for the green transition and adopting a multi stakeholders and partnership approach to ensure gender and social equity are key drivers for Yossi work. Welcome, dear Yossi. Over to you. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Laura, uh, and the hosts at, uh, at the uh, Alliance for Financial Inclusion. Um, I'd just like to say that uh, I'm very honored to be actually participating in this, uh, in this event. Uh, I think it's uh, as the utmost important at this time, especially, and uh, kind of greening, bringing green practices, sustainable practices to to vulnerable community, um, there's, there's almost kind of, it's, it's my top priority and uh, it should be on, on, on everyone's and I think it's, it's on yours, of course. So I'm uh, again, very happy to participate. Um, through, through this uh, kind of presentation, I have put together a few fly, slides. Um, initially, initially, I'd like to provide some kind of a background for what is currently happening with the microfinance with first of all the vulnerable uh, communities, um, then microfinance, uh, what are the kind of the policy actions being taken? But I will leave the floor to my uh, co-panelists on that one, and then I will kind of describe how to perhaps bring together the private sector uh, assisting stimulus and kind of the shortcomings of current stimulus, and how can we actually put together. Um, uh, something which, which will actually make a change on the ground and would bring the required resources for vulnerable communities through the financial institutions. Uh, I will also bring some practical examples of products, many of them uh, you are aware, but the scope of the products and how, and the, the, I would say the vast opportunity which is out there. In fact, I, I actually have many times in discussions with MFIs difficulty in actually conveying what is actually the opportunity because they are not simply aware of them. So yeah, so I can start with the um, with the slides. Um, so we all know, of course, how uh, how devastating the impact is for uh, vulnerable communities, and and basically looking at examples, they've already been worked done on that on that front. Uh, looking in, in 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 Africa on issues such as uh, disrupted serial banks. Um, basically the closure of borders and movements, inability to actually earn uh, other funds apart from uh, rural agriculture, uh, limited access to partners, to credit from partners. And that of course affects uh, gender issues. Uh, what is you know, part of the, the immediate effect of health and food security are of course evident there's no social safety net. What, what, of course, um, is, is on top of that is the uh, also financial, financial burden and potential, uh, 
potential actually impact on the uh, financial sector. Uh, as, as we can see, I mean, at the moment, there are further actions, certain actions being taken, but it remains to be seen how are actually those vulnerable communities uh, actually, how do they, uh, how do they deal with those actions and what would be the consequences in a few months time? Uh, moving to the next, uh, to actually to the next slide, um, looking at microfinance institutions, I mean, there is um, certainly an impact uh, all across the regions and with focus especially on the South and Southeast Asia, where I'm uh, actually based. A measure of power 30, in fact, looks at the, uh, at the, um, a, at a rate, a, at a rear a loans rate, a 30 days rear loans rate. As, as we see, I mean, the, the dark uh, blue part is post uh, pre pandemic, where the green, uh, uh, the green part on the right is post pandemic. And we can see that in all regions, there is very much an increase in the risk of. Uh, of basically uh, of financial of microfinance institutions, it has to we have to take that into consideration that this is a small sampling fact, and also the other implementing factors such as the fact that financial institutions have stopped lending and that has revealed a certain gap which was there in the first place. But we can certainly see a change in this key uh, parameter. Going to the next slide. Um, we look at the um, liquidity, liquidity issues. So, you know, the charts on the right basically um, they demonstrate the amount of cash at hand pre and post a pandemic uh, and how that cash, how, ma how many, many months actually that cash could actually be used to finance the, the microfinance operation. So, as, as we can see, actually, there's not, not a huge change between 2016 and, and May 2020. However, uh, so most, most uh, institutions, in fact, have beyond 12 months of cash to, to actually deal with the pandemic, uh, with the liquidity issue. However, uh, when looking actually more closely, I mean, it, it does, it is not clearly a, a good picture what we are seeing, because uh, it really very much, again, coming back to the fact that they're not lending more, so, so they basically have more cash. They've taken operational uh, uh, cost-effective measurements. Uh, so in a way, they're not, they, they've reduced staffing, they, they are uh, uh, reducing uh, branching costs, et cetera, et cetera. However, uh, the, the full extent of the effect remains to be seen once we are back to normal operation. And also we have to understand that the smaller refis, if in fact, the ratios looks far, far worse. And most, many of the smaller MFIs, um, I would say that 10%, uh, almost 10% don't have cash, cash on hand to cover even a uh, one month. And the smaller MFIs are actually in greater danger of, of bankruptcy. Uh, and that is of course, many supervisors are, are aware of this situation. Um, again, moving to the next slide, um, we, when we look at the um, um, simply what the, the response of MFIs to the crisis. So as you've seen in, in your countries, I mean, there is reducing of course immediately uh, rep repayments uh, and you can see the different, the different actions by MFIs for the immediate, uh, for, for the immediate response, uh, also supervised and supported by the central banks or the supervising body uh, to, the, to the epidemic. Um, I'd like to move the policy responses to COVID. And on this part, I mean, this is still not touching the green. I will let also my colleagues and in Mawa is also, um, very nicely described the, the Bank of Egypt's uh, uh, response. But uh, of course, the focus needs to be um, with the lens of, of actually protecting the poor, um, take the, the initiatives protecting the poor and looking at it from various perspectives, uh, reaching the formal and informal uh, uh, societies or financial institutions, uh, having a broad effect 
uh, doing the uh, immediate relief and making sure that there is no, um, no negative effect on, on indebtors in debt in the pools or bringing negative consequences to, to all the help provided. Um, continuously and uh, supporting of MFIs of, of, of course of crucial importance. Uh, that's enough that we will have an issue with MFIs to affect the entire financial institutions and economy. Uh, we need to make sure and policymakers are doing so that, uh, that they are monitoring portfolio quality and it's a very delicate, uh, as you, many of you are aware, it's a very delicate task uh, to really make sure that what policy is being deployed and what is the effect, you know, not only in one month, but in a few months time. Uh, continuing with policy responses, uh, of course, uh, prudential places need to be put in place. Uh, further initiatives such as uh, guarantee schemes need to be implemented uh, and grant schemes. And of course, the supervision it needs to keep its, uh, its key role and it's very important that they don't deviate from, from the indicators, from the, uh, from the classifications, etc. However, with that in mind, it needs to be and despite of actually following those indicators, perhaps officially and some countries have taken action, let's say if a certain trigger happens, okay, so this is not a classification and, 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 and maybe there is more flexibility on compliance and of course, uh, in order to keep the financial system uh, at place. Um, I'd like to, um, to just provide uh, a few examples of countries, uh, what countries have done. And if we look at Peru, uh, Uganda, uh, Kenya, Pakistan, I've taken a few examples of, of activities, uh, things that I'm sure that most of you have seen, uh, moratorium, uh, reporting, uh, and also rescheduling of loans, deferment. All of these, these are measures that, that are extremely important, but uh, they need to be done uh, properly. They need to be done uh, very carefully. And, and this is a very, very serious, very serious task that we are not gonna be ending up with, uh, with basically indebted communities and, and harm to the environment and, and society. Um, I'd like to move on uh, and I think more touch the, the green aspect. Um, so of course there are great challenges as, as described in this uh, slide. Uh, there's little stimulus for green at the moment. Um, I will show the situation in ASEAN. Uh, there is MFIs uh, are kind of standalone in many countries and they need to be part, an integral part of the financial community and supervisory role is extremely difficult at these times. Uh, and of course, there is lack of uh, protection for depositors for MFIs. So we, everybody's kind of focusing now on moratorium and, and loans, but there are many other very important issues to deal with. Um, the following kind of, touching the green part, I think the following, uh, the following kind of uh, uh, a slide uh, describes nicely the challenges that developing economies have versus uh, developed economies uh, on actually reaching a sustainable development goal uh, due, to the, um, due to the epidemic. Uh, so if it is relatively easy for, uh, for developing nations to, to actually to make that jump and, and reach sustainable development goals uh, through kind of greening the economy at this time via stimulus packages, then the situation is far more difficult for developing economies and poor nations where they need to simply, they can spend much less of course of GDP and they still and they need to put most of the funds into, into the immediate health uh, relief, which is health, uh, employment, uh, uh, immediate uh, poverty. Um, I'd just like to touch the, to, to move to the next slide. And there's work done by um, SEI on S Stockholm Environment Institute on basically on, with ASEAN countries. Uh, so just looking at the fact, uh, looking at the 10 ASEAN countries, Indonesia, Vietnam, Myanmar, Brunei, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, PDR, uh, 
in those certain most all of these countries, of course, put stimulus uh, packages forward, but it's very evident to see that a, a lot of it is not reaching the informal economy. Uh, if perhaps you can move to the next uh, slide, we can see the, the chart. Uh, so a lot of the funds are actually not reaching the, um, the, uh, the, 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 formal the informal economy. So most of it goes to formal, to the formal economy and therefore actually not reaching the poor. And also in developing economies, it is very clear and, and shown that, that actually most funds actually reach as uh, SDGs uh, and not only uh, touch one or two, while in, de in developing in the poor economies, uh, it, is, it is very much uh, the funds which are being used as similar packages are much lower and they actually only touch uh, some aspects. So in a way, um, we need to actually have the package that should be diversified, informal and formal sector, and basically uh, targeting, for instance, informal MSCs, something which is uh, it's a difficult task, but if we need to actually impact the poor, this is something that, uh, that needs to be done. Um, we can move to actually um, the next slide, uh, blending in private sector. Um, it's, um, I think that uh, it's kind of clear for especially the poor nations that uh, with the amount, with the funds that they have, and a stimulus packages could only could only reach could only do, go some way. They, and one way, one important way to supplement that is like other initiatives is through blended finance and private sector. So uh, we are actually working at, at Earthquake. Uh, we in Asia Pacific. We are actually working on a, an approach. To, to put together a, a donor funds in a blended uh, approach and basically bringing through capital markets uh, the required liquidity and loans uh, for MFIs, both microfinance institutions and other institutions who are serving the MSMEs and the poor. And the idea is to uh, align those funds with the green and sustainability projects. So, um, if financing is required for those MFIs, we can actually, uh, the, the blended finance approach by putting in a donor trust funds as, as a first loss, allows other players to actually go into the financial kind of a wagon for capital markets and raise very large amount of sums. And here it, uh, it's kind of our first launch, I'm talking about $150 million to actually deploy as loans to microfinance, to, inst to financial institutions, and then to work with them on actually developing uh, the green, the sustainable work with the, co with the poor communities. So um, the emphasis uh, on the resilience and adaptation as well, and disaster risk allows the financial institution, in fact, to be kind of a one-stop uh, shop to, to deal with not only mitigation, but also adaptation, resilience, and the issues which are facing the vulnerable communities, which they, are, they are actually have accessibility to. Um, so the, of course there is a great scale um, and uh, for that, those initiatives. And I'd like to just move to the next slide and just um, this perhaps can provide a description of a typical structure uh, where uh, institutional funds, impact funds, family offices are joins, uh, joining a donor country funds and through capital markets, basically providing loans to the various MFIs. And a very important element uh, under this is to have a very uh, high ratio of technical assistance facility. So if we are, if existing facilities uh, or, or loans to MFIs or financial institutions are actually, they, they do have technical assistance, which maybe is a 5% of the portfolio. So here the task is transition. We are transition economies, we are transition financial institutions. We are, uh, we are transition vulnerable communities. We are actually working also with the technical assistance facility with the governments, with regulators, central governments, uh, uh, local governments. And therefore this, the technical assistance component must be large for the transition. So a sustainability bond at first phase, moving and transitioning to a green bond at the second phase. And this will time after perhaps 20% of, of finance 
will actually be actually be a 20% technical assistant facility company. Um, so that is that is actually key for for a transition to make sure that we are not making efforts and moving things and after one two years things are actually going back to normal and then we are not achieving our purposes so if we look at the next slide uh, the technical assistance component of such a transition needs to actually focus on capital markets and microfinance institutions and other financial institutions uh, communities and borrowers they need to adopt to financial instruments they need to adopt to to uh, to to the to the new technologies to new ways of doing things and to policymakers and regulators this work needs to be done hand in hand with policymakers and regulators in order to make it to make it happen there needs to be a collaboration on all fronts in order for this to to actually uh, to take place uh, the next slide a slide actually talks about uh, how to actually do we monitor how do we actually measure the impact so there will be key um, there needs to be key kpis for MFIs to actually follow, to, to describe uh, their activities, how it is progressing, how the transition is progressing. So we do not, the, the intention is not to overburden uh, MFIs or financial institutions. And I think that also supervisor, uh, bank supervisors are aware of that. And, and you also as policymakers do not want to overburden MFIs uh, with reporting and eventually the, it really kind of doesn't achieve its results. So what we are trying to do is actually really target key aspects that are also aligned with TCFD, are also aligned with showing the microfinance institutions the opportunity, the opportunity ahead for them in order to, for them to actually measure, in order for them to actually go forward in the transition path and really understand what they're doing. So, um, so the, this reporting and measurement and impact measurement is, is very important for us. For this for actually for making such a transition um, so i'd like to next slides actually describe a few uh, few such products uh, that we have I've taken example from uh, some of our partners in uh, in africa latin america and asia um, so uh, the, the the green the sustainable and green product development with with financial institutions is 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 actually across all sectors. And I've, I've brought actually examples from the agriculture sector and from uh, mostly agriculture and a lot to do with uh, work at home and, and for women. Uh, but I mean, the, the activity is spanned across uh, um, basically mini grids. Uh, so, uh, so energy, uh, transportation, so electric bikes, uh, housing, energy efficiency, uh, sustainable housing, uh, so so financial providers can work on developing products all across the sector, uh, which green, uh, sustainable, uh, adaptation, energy efficient, resilient, and also disaster uh, disaster risk related. So, if we uh, if we are uh, focusing on each and every of those individuals, what we have in fact created is a sustainable resilience society. And we have also a transfer, trans, transition the financial institutions in, to sustainability. And the effect for those financial institutions is as if they've issued a green bond. It's as if they've issued a sustainability bond. So just to, to be clear, this facility that I'm describing includes 20, finance, 20 microfinance institutions in Asia Pacific. So by issuing a bond in, a, in, a, in actually a, a financial hub, that allows 20 microfinance institutions uh, for funds, for substantial long-term funds to work on green initiatives. And the effect is as if they themselves had issued a green bond. Um, there was also a comment uh, recently just to mention by the uh, um, by the fiscal director of the of the IMF and I think it is very clear that uh, those rich countries which have accessibility for ca to capital markets are in very uh, advanced position to to actually to to deal with the epidemic and to work on effective on get resources for stimulus rather 
while the poorer nations with less developed financial system and without accessibility to capital markets would actually be have would have great difficulties in responding to the uh, to the uh, to the epidemic. Uh, so I think I'd like to sum it here and and really thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak to to this uh, distinguished crowd today. Thank you very much, dear Yossi, for this um, for this very uh, very nice overview, very com complete overview. And yeah, so regarding the, the, the responses to COVID nineteen that you presented, I really uh, found very interesting the the ones that you mentioned in on protecting the poor by cash transfer, restructuring of loans, deferring the debt, the debt collection. Um, also ensuring continuity of the microfinance institutions, leveraging technology to ensure uh, that microfinance institutions continue to operate and monitor portfolio quality. Um, yeah, by putting in place prevention measures like providing additional liquidity available for micro for uh, institutions, for financial institutions as well, and the availability of credit warranty schemes. Uh, also, uh, regarding the supervision changes, uh, providing more flexibility on compliance, but also we see that we are still having some challenges. And yeah, especially you point out something very important that is the relief shouldn't shouldn't be negatively uh, shouldn't negatively affect a borrower credit profile. So therefore, risk assessment play a role in COVID-19 recovery. Very interesting and thank you very much. So our following speakers will present a couple of examples from AFI members of green post-COVID-19 responses. We will start with the case of Philippines and to that end, uh, please join me to welcome Veronica Vallangos. Veronica has been the Director of the Supervisory Policy and Research Department under the financial supervision sector Central Bank from of the Philippines since January 2018. Um, Veronica is the Inclusive Green Finance Working Group co-chair <clears throat> and a member of the VSP Technical Working Group on Sustainable Finance and an alternate representative of the VSP in the scaling up green finance work stream of the Central Bank and Supervisors uh, Network for Green in the Financial System. Dear Veronica, Thank you very much, and we'll leave to you. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, again, thank you for inviting me to share the BSP's um, approach in mainstreaming sustainable finance amid the pandemic. Um, what I will do in the next uh, 10 minutes or so is that I will uh, explain the BSP's approach in mainstream streaming sustainable finance. Second, I will also discuss the sustainable finance framework, um, which was decisively issued by the BSP at the height of the lockdown and its implications to banks. Third, I'm going to share the efforts of Philippine banks in the sustainable finance space. And finally, I will share the commitment of the BSP as an organization in embracing sustainability principles. Now the next slide gives us an overview of the BSP approach towards sustainable finance. In line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, the BSP adopted a broader stance to cover the full spectrum of sustainable development, both the environmental and the social element. We saw that climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic could lead to disruptive events that could shake or rattle the entire financial system and the economy, ultimately testing our strength and resilience. Now, the sustainability journey of the BSP started more than five years ago with some of our fiscal agencies. The early years were focused on building capacity and awareness. The BSP actively participates in discussions on key aspects of sustainability in both regional and global network or collaboration of supervisors. In fact, in July 2020, 
we, we became a plenary member of the central banks and supervisors network for greening the financial system. We also conducted a scoping research to better understand how to best embed the environmental and social risk management or what we call ESRM and sustainability principles in the business decisions of financial institutions. More recently, we completed a research on the impact of extreme weather episodes on the Philippine banking sector using branch level supervisory data. Now we also continue to build the capacity of our supervised financial institutions and our supervisors. In terms of regulatory pathway to mainstream sustainable finance, we have taken a phased approach in issuing sustainability or the environmental, social and governance related guidelines. The first phase was the release of the sustainable finance framework in April 2020, or as I mentioned earlier on at the peak of the lockdown period in Manila or the national capital region. Some may question the timing of such an issuance, but the BSP sets its objective of laying the groundwork for sustainable finance amid the pandemic. Now, the second phase will cover more granular expectations on how banks will manage such risk in relation to credit, market, liquidity, and operational risks. We also intend to issue supplemental stress testing guidelines for better appreciation of the impact of climate change risk and other environment related risk on individual financial institutions and on the whole system. Now, the third phase may cover potential regulatory incentives for banks in adhering to sustainability principles. We are proposing to consider lending for green projects as a form of compliance with a mandatory credit to the agriculture sector. Now, in the next slide, I will briefly touch on the key provisions of the sustainable uh, finance framework. The BSP believes that the optimal approach remains to be one that is enabling as such the framework provides ample flexibility, considers the bank's risk appetite and business models, and applies standards and tools that are proportionate to the size, nature, and complexity of bank operations. Another key feature of the framework is that it is anchored on the existing BSP regulations on corporate and risk governance standards. The framework also sub, uh, subscribes to high level principles on sustainability. S hence, the definitions and specific guidelines were developed by adopting the principles prescribed by various international conventions, multilateral agencies, and other standard setting bodies, and applying this in the Philippine context. Now, considering the possible long term adjustments needed for banks to comply with the provisions of the framework, Banks are given a three-year transitory period from effectivity of the circular. Now, in the next slide, I will briefly mention the key elements of the framework. First, the role of the board of directors and senior management is crucial in institutionalizing the adoption of this sustainability framework. Second, on the adoption and implementation of an environmental and social manage, social risk management system, banks are given the flexibility to manage their ENS risk, risk exposures or environmental and social uh, risk exposures. Third, the framework aims to uh, enhance market discipline and promote transparency. The framework requires banks to disclose in their annual reports several elements of their sustainability agenda. Now, the next slide is uh, pretty interesting because what I will do is that I will share the early journey of the Philippine banks. Prior to the re release of the sustainable finance framework, some big banks are ahead in the green finance front. They have taken the first move to integrate and implement sustainability principles in their business operations. Now, this includes the adoption of ESRM, adherence to sustainability reporting requirements, development of broader sus sustainability frameworks, and issuance of green, social, and sustainability bonds. 
Now, under the adoption of ESRM, two large private banks created sustainable energy finance desks, which both serve as the point of contact in evaluating and monitoring sustainable energy projects. When it comes to sustainability reporting, several banks, uh, big banks, have issued sustainability reports which disclose their respective strategies in ESG integration in their operations. Now, there are several private large banks which have developed their respective sustainability framework. Um, for instance, one big bank's framework defines its sustainability strategies, which are aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals and principles of the U UN Global Compact. Now, what is interesting in this pan pandemic is that two large government banks have also develop their respective green financing frameworks. If I may mention, the Land Bank of the Philippines implemented a project, a, a framework called Climate Smart. Smart stands for synergistic mitigation, adaptation, resiliency, and transformation financing program. The program provides the following lending facilities, such as carbon finance support facility, renewable energy lending program, Go Green Inclusive Financing for SMEs and LGUs program. LBP, uh, the Land Bank was also approved as the accessing entities of the Green Climate Fund. Now, another uh, big government bank has a green financing program, an umbrella program to support the bank's strategic thrust of environmental protection and the country's green growth strategy. The program was designed primarily to assist strategic sectors, industries, and LGUs in adopting environment-friendly processes and technologies and incorporating climate change adaptation and mitigation and disaster risk reduction measures by providing financing and technical assistance. Now, there are also banks which issued green social or sustainability bonds the latest was issued or was raised by a big private bank from its issuance of COVID action response or care bonds, where proceeds of which will be used to finance or refinance eligible MSMEs under the bank's sustainable funding framework. The care bonds qualify as social bonds under the ASEAN social bond standards in the Philippines. Now, the last slide, which I have, is actually uh, the Sustainable Central Banking Program, an initiative by the BSP as an organization, um, which is meant to adopt the sustainable finance, uh, which is meant to be part of the strategic map of the BSP for 2020 to 2023 to foster environmentally responsible and sustainable policies and work practices within the BSP. Now, the Sustainable Central Banking Program adapts a phased approach to implementation. In the first phase, the BSP will endeavor to build awareness and increase understanding among the top and middle management on sustainability concepts. This first phase was held about two weeks ago. Now, in the second phase, the BSP will conduct two layers of assessment on the impact of climate change, not just in the BSP head office, but to BSP offices, branches, units, and operations outside Manila. The results of the above exercises will feed into the development of the BSP's roadmap for sustainable central banking. This roadmap will provide the key steps or milestones, plans, and strategies towards the adoption of sustainability principles in the regulatory and supervisory framework and integration of ESG factors in the BSP's culture and governance, enterprise-wide risk management system, consumer protection, and financial education advocacies, investment management decisions, and other operational activities of the BSP. To conclude my, my presentation, um, the BSP believes that 
true to the concept of embracing sustainability principles, the BSP and the banking industry are working together to advance this agenda in the Philippine financial sector, inspiring clients and other stakeholders, both in the government and the private sector in making environmentally and socially responsible business decisions. If I will um, borrow Yosef um, uh, term earlier on, blending with the private sector and other sectors will be crucial in the road to uh, sustainable banking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, thank you very much for this insightful presentation. Uh, so we can hear that the BSP journey uh, in enhancing the sustainable financial framework through the sustainability principles. Also, we heard about green policies like lending to green projects, specifically target the agriculture sector, that is the most vulnerable one. Um, yeah, Veronica also presented the journey of banks in developing the sustainable finance framework and the coordination mechanisms involved, what is really, really interesting. And yeah, she concludes saying that the development of the BSP roadmap, which includes a risk assessment operational activities inside the BSP, what is a very new and it's a, an innovative uh, risk assessment. Thank you very much, Veronica. And last but not uh, and least but not last but not least, I'm sorry. Allow me to welcome Mr. Iqbal Hussein. Iqbal has 14 years in enhancing central banking experience. Before that, he worked for a private bank. And he is the winner of the Bank of the Bank Employee Recognition Award in 2012. His current key, his current key work areas include policy guidelines on products and services of the banks, new bank licensing, and business center expansion of the banks, offshore banking in Bangladesh, and new policy initiatives for financial infrastructure development. Since long, he's actively involved with the financial inclusion and responsible financing from the, of the country. Iqbal bears an objective to contribute in the economic development of the countries through working for a sustainable financial infrastructure, analyzing the microprudential linkages in the real, external, fiscal, and monetary sectors. Thank you very much, Ipal. Over to you. Thank you, Laura. Thanks for a very nice introduction about me. Thank you. So today, uh, I'll be sharing some of the some of the information about uh, the greening recovery from the COVID-19. I'll share some experience from the Central Bank of Bangladesh and Bangladesh perspective. Uh, going forward, I will share some of the impacts that we faced in Bangladesh about COVID-19 pandemic, then some of the initiatives taken by our government and the central bank. Then I'll, I'll share some of the key learnings that we learned from these uh, pandemic situations, the crisis that is going uh, all over the world. So good day to everyone. Uh, if I go to the next slide, uh, this is where I'm from. I'm from the Southeast Asia, Bangladesh, beside India, Nepal, Myanmar. And this is my, uh, my central bank. It looks like this at the right side. Next slide, please. COVID-19. COVID-19 became a very strange thing for, uh, for all of us. Within a few days, uh, it spreaded all over the world like stranger, very, very tough, tough stranger. And it's, it, teach, it teaches us a lot, lot of things. So the first case we, we found in our country is on 8 March. And uh, up to yesterday, and there was uh, 400,000 cases. And it was 5,800 reported deaths already. So we are second most affected country in the South Asia after India. So. Uh, over the last decades, we had a we had a very good, impressive growth in terms of uh, GDP, GDP growth rate. It was it was more than seven percent in the last decade, and the projected growth rate for the next uh, next year was eight percent, more than eight percent. But what happened after the uh, uh, crisis that we faced, the COVID crisis, it uh, it became actually 
5.24 percent for the 2019-20. Uh, the actual was 5.24 percent. The projection of World Bank became 1.6 percent, and IMF 3.8 percent. Then ADB 4.5 percent for 2020. But the good thing is the projections for the uh, next years are quite satisfying for for our country. So hopefully we'll be recovering this COVID crisis within very short time because our uh, we have a totality of uh, from the government part, from the central bank part, uh, initiatives taken uh, to handle the, the crisis as well. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we, we would, next slide, please. Uh, so we, we have taken, our government have taken some special in initiatives, nationwide lockdown from um, 23rd March to 30th May. After that, actually it was, uh, it was so social distancing and all other all other safety measures. Then our all educational institutions closed. Then then government started uh, to to take awareness building programs. The COVID to handle this COVID nineteen uh, impact or to manage the impact to recover from the from the devastating devastating outcome of the covid-19 financial stimulus package around 12 million usd a 19 financial stimulus package was announced by the uh, by the government out of that eight was uh, directly uh, central bank was involved with the eight of them then the stimulus fund or in some in some stimulus packages central bank central bank took the chance to go for financial inclusion as well because we had some uh, stimulus package that we instructed the banks to distribute directly to the uh, to uh, to the account of the employees of different companies so many of the uh, employees like in rmg sector ready made garment sector which is which is actually prominent in our our, our country so they didn't have uh, formal formal accounts formal financial accounts so for those stimulus packages there was a stimulation and they, they, was, they were bound to open bank accounts or mobile financial accounts. So if we see the impact in three months from March to June, in three months, the number of active mobile financial accounts increased 59%. It's, it's tremendous. So this is for the, for the push of the central bank. I, I would say this is a big push for the inclusion. We also have many refinancing facilities for green financing and environmental friendly financing, but the change that that came during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, our green transformation fund, we have one, and that was made of, made of 200 million USD, but we introduced 200 million euro uh, in the, during this pandemic with, with that fund, uh, in that fund. So in this fund, financing to all manufacturer exporters against the import of capital machineries and accessories for implementing specified green environmental friendly initiatives. So these are green projects, project funding. So Eurofund, the new, new, new inclusion uh, is also admissible to long-term financing on, for all manufacturing industries, industrial ent enterprises for impo importing of environmental friendly and energy efficient green capital machineries and accessories and bias credit to import industrial raw materials used in the manufacturing enterprises. So this was some of the initiatives. There are many more initiatives. I, I'm just summarizing some of them because there was CRR uh, reserve requirement reduction, interest rate reduction, there was um, EDF, uh, export development fund. There were many, many other initiatives, but some of the initiatives I have just noted here to, to collaborate, to, to connect it with a green recovery. So to the next slide, please. Uh, these are the uh, financial inclusion initiatives that Central Bank has taken over the time. But uh, as we are talking about the green recovery, I will skip this, this uh, slide and the next slide also. I'll go to the third slide. So these are financial inclusion initiatives, then green banking initiatives in, in our Central Bank. Then if I go to the next slide, then we'll see in 2011, 2011, we issued instructions, some guidelines to the, to the banks for green banking. That, that policy guideline included lots of, lots of like planning, planning that, that, that have to be done in the, in the, in the next phase. So 
that guideline, uh, that guide, uh, the previous slide says, that guideline included about, section about grain finance, then the risk management, uh, no, no, the next slide please. Next slide. Please. Uh, uh, Green Bank, yes, yes. Uh, the, the previous slide please. So we have, we instruct, uh, we advise the bank to, to, to make a climate risk fund to, to do green marketing than online, online banking uh, in 2011. So these were the instructions that bank, uh, bank started following and the baseline of green financial infrastructure started developing from that time. There was, there started the sustainable reporting as well, product innovation, then green branches, so these all sort of instructions was given in 2011 and following this, our financial green infrastructure was being developed. So going to the next slide, please. The learnings that we have, we have got from this uh, pandemic, if, if I can share. The learning is the COVID-19 was devastating. Uh, we, we have seen the reported date is uh, nearly 6,000. It's, it's too high. But also, also it gave us some lessons. I Means the learning curve. We, we have got a shift in our learning curve. We know that if if we have dense population, it's that it's main, in many ways bad for us. But population also gives dense dividend, demographic dividend to us. I I believe the crisis crisis also sometimes give a dividend. So this is crisis dividend. So crisis correct long term imperfections that that are that gets inbuilt in the in the system. So we, we now are getting at home revolution. So everything people are now thinking how things can be done from home, staying at home. So we are doing everything office from home. We are doing all purchases, all services from home. We're doing all online classes. So at home revolution, and this is a digital, digital discovery in our country because everyone is trying to do digital, digital many things. I've already mentioned that 59% increase in the mobile financial services, mobile financial accounts in three months. So it's, it's tremendous. Also one more thing, rebuilding is important, not only the recovery, because what would, what would we get if we recover? We'll go to the, uh, go like three or four months back. Uh, in our country, in three or four months back, we were not in a position that we, we dreamt for. So we need to, we need to get actually, we need to restart things so that we can rebuild to our out in our dreaming dreaming position. So rebuilding is important. We are we are uh, trying to trying to go for that. Then phase in arrangement works best for every type of initiative. Then adoption adopting new learning from experience and successes of other peer is the best to stimulate participants. So supranational organizations are the source of very useful diversified data. So we are coordinated approach. If we take that, would be most efficient and actually uh, that that will bring the real output. Going digital is a big push that I just men mentioned. That going digital is a big push. Deploying resources is a challenge, but adequate know-how reaches first. So the main challenge is deploying resources, whether we have the resource or not. So nowadays, central bank is uh, giving refinance refinance schemes. I already mentioned that around uh, 13 13 billion US dollars. So if we go to the next, uh, if I conclude here, I would say, I would say that greening the post COVID uh, recovery uh, would be, would be, would be a tough, tough job. But so far, what the initiatives have been taken, that would actually, actually, actually bring some very environmental friendly and uh, sustainable output because this would actually correct many of the errors that we used to do in, in, our, in our past. So I'll conclude here. Uh, for the time, I would really welcome any question, question for answering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a very, very interesting presentation. And yes, so we can hear now that the, about the Bangladesh Bank response initiatives and also about the stimulus that the COVID-19 stimulus for a salary to be disbursed on employment account. 
uh, had a really huge impact. There is the, the increment of 59% of accounts. And it was about the Green Transformation Fund. It's, um, it's also a very good one. So we are rushing a little bit with time. And I would like to just go for the first round of questions to you. So um, just let me directly, let me go directly to the questions. And I would like just to ask Josie, so what is the relevance of green in the COVID-19 recovery? Um, yeah, I think, well, um, the relevance is huge because the, the green recovery, in my view, uh, that's where the opportunity lies. And if we are going to be uh, uh, recovering without the green, without this opportunity, um, it is simply not an opportunity. We need to provide tools for, for the poor, for communities. To, to transform, to transition, um, and for also the financial institutions involved to, to gain from the opportunity. And uh, the availability of international funds will also be, uh, will also be corresponding to, to sustainability and green. So, and the opportunity will be missed there. So availability of international funds sooner or later will be for green. And therefore, uh, the, the financial institutions need to understand that. The uh, regulators, of course, I think will also be moving forward on that. And, and the vulnerable communities will be benefiting from a new economy, from a new reality. Thank you very much, Josie. And yeah, I would like to ask one question to Iqbal and Veronica, the same question. So, uh, what was the trigger from the central banks to lead these green approaches in the post-COVID-19 response? If, if, if I take the question, the trigger was, uh, as I said, that rebuilding, not only recovery. And firstly, the, uh, we are talking about greening the post-COVID recovery. We are not yet post. We are, st we are still still on, on COVID. So we don't know when it's when it going to end. So the trigger started when uh, when we first hit by the covid and uh, it was increasing with rapid rapid rate rapid growth rate our government uh, our government uh, started thinking how to how to tackle it because you know we are we are in a, a we are a developing country and 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 we are overpopulated country as well so we have to take something that will tackle the growth growth of the devastation also, we have to take some measures so that we not only go back to our previous recovery, it means we know that recovery have many shapes, V-shape, U-shape, and K-shape, many shapes. So we are always hoping for V-shape recovery. But the recovery should be, the recovery should be uh, a recovery that was always expected by all of us. Means we, after, re after recovery, we should be in a, in a stage that, that is green, that is responsible, that is sustainable and keeping the next generation in our mind. So to keep the next generation in our mind in the financial infrastructure, we need, uh, I think the recovery should always be green. Reco recovery should always be responsible recovery. So that can be treated as uh, gr green recovery. That's what we are talking, talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, in the case of the Philippines, uh, the trigger is actually not only the pandemic or the COVID, but also the experience of the Philippines uh, from extreme um, uh, weather events, such as um, Yolanda and other um, significant uh, monsoon rains that we have experienced. What happened was, uh, following those episodes, both the government and uh, the local government units and also the, the central bank or the BSP uh, started to build up, set up, formulated, in the case of the national government, disaster plans. 
in the case of the local government units, they've also had their localized disaster plans. In the case of uh, the BSP, um, we instituted the business continuity plans and um, other uh, guidelines on restructuring um, of the balance sheets of the banks. Um, in other words, it's not only uh, because of pandemic, but also because of our experience. The difference is that in the case of the COVID, the impact was much more massive on the real sector. But in many aspects of it, uh, our government agencies are prepared for, for such an eventuality. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now I would like to open the floor for, for the audience. And yeah, up to now we have three questions. So the first one is from Jorge Moncayo from uh, Ecuador. And he's asking uh, where he can find more information of, uh, on sustainability framework. And yeah, Veronica have already replied. So she will share uh, the circular on sustainable financial framework. Thank you very much, Veronica. We have another question from Fethi Akari. Thank you very much. What are the most involved financial actors in boosting inclusive green finance? Retail, banks, mutuals, development banks? Did the bank comply to the responsible banking principles? So this, questions, uh, this question I would like to, to flag to Veronica. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, I guess all the uh, banking groups in the Philippines are involved in 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 this kind of endeavor. Um, um, like in the case of, but but the type but the type of involvement is a bit different, right? For small, uh, for um, big banks, their involvement are more on securing financing for sustainable finance. Uh, we have also thrift banks. I think there are about 48 thrift banks outside the National Capital Region and Manila, uh, or Manila. And we have uh, 444 uh, rural banks in the countryside. For those type of um, um, banks, they are more grounded, meaning they can go to the countryside, uh, they can go to the countryside. So um, they are more um, grounded in implementing um, exposures or implementing projects uh, related to green finance. So that's the typology that uh, we are seeing in the Philippines. Retail you, banks man. are uh, retail banks are predominantly uh, thrift banks, actually. Thank you very much, Veronica. And yeah, we have another question from Brenda Mwansa from Bank of Tanzania. I'm sorry, Bank of Zimbabwe. I think, or uh, sorry, I think that I'm confusing if it's Zambia or Zimbabwe. But the question is. <clears throat> most finance, Zambia, I'm sorry, Bank of Zambia, that is most financial COVID-19 response measures impact formal sector. What is the best framework to reach the informal sector and vulnerable poor or vulnerable population? And yeah, to this for this question, I would like to, to ask to Joseph, what is your what is your yeah, your overview, your perspective on these questions? Yeah, I, th I think that's a very, uh, very important point where, where in fact the stimulus packages as seen by the ASEAN uh, uh, case, not most of it, but all entirely is reaching the formal sector. And, uh, and how can we, can we actually reach the informal? Uh, financial inclusion by itself is, is, uh, is a solution. Financial inclusion to, to actually bring the informal into into financial inclusion, it's it's a one step one step on, on that front. But I think 
the, um, it, it, there is no easy solution here. And I think stakeholders need to sit down, uh, financial institutions, uh, regulators, uh, DFIs, and try to define those informal uh, sectors and, and make a kind of a, a, a together, an approach together to actually reach to those sectors. Uh, is what is not measured is of course uh, is something that we don't see, but but eventually we will see that, and it will have a, a huge impact on the on the on the communities and of course on the entire economy. So we do need to identify the, the actors, and we do need to to act uh, in, co in in kind of together. And but I think that the financial institutions are, should play a key role, either. Uh, MFIs or equivalent institutions in countries, they play a key role because they're on the ground and they have the outreach. Uh, yeah. Thank you very if much. I may, yeah, if I may add, Laura. Yes, if I yes, may yes, add. Yes, uh, just to share the approach uh, taken by the Philippines. I believe the, the best framework is still the whole of nation approach, right, wherein the executive uh, branch of the, the country is involved. So that's the president and vice presidents and the lawmakers. Uh, we have congressmen and senators. And then in the middle, you have the financial institutions. And then of course, the, the recipients of, the, of uh, the stimulus. What happened in the Philippines was that, especially uh, for stimulus, uh, uh, for the pandemic, there was a um, big uh, legislation coming from the executive branch uh, identifying uh, the, the recipients as the most vulnerable groups like the MSMEs, the youth, um, and uh, other uh, enterprises or vulnerable sectors in the economy. So there was a massive a requirement from from uh, from the government to allot funds going to the most vulnerable sectors, and then the financial and then the BSP complemented that uh, massive um, legislation with prudential and regulatory reform measures, specifically to the MSMEs. Right, measures were. Uh, mandated to incentivize lending like to the MSMEs like temporary reduction of credit risk weights for MSME loans, assignment of zero risk weights to MSMEs guaranteed loans, MSME loans as an alternative compliance to reserve requirements. And then after that, we um, enjoined required banks to um, comply not only with the requirements of the BSP, but also of the requirements by the national government. So basically it's a whole of government approach for you to make sure that stimulus uh, go into the most uh, vulnerable sectors of the economy. I also, I also want to add something with this, Laura. If you yes, yes, sure. yes, of course. Uh, to, to, to get the informal sector formalize it or or to the to the rural sectors our banks are doing means in earlier days people 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 had to come to the bank's premise but now banks are going to to the people they, they are those steps so they are doing their agent banking they're they're doing the some digital financial services we also have microfinance institutes so they are also they are also onboarding those those clients to the those potential customers to the financial arena and also for the informal sectors, we are liberalizing or simplifying the KYC requirements than uh, some many of the trade license or other other documentation requirements for account opening. Uh, we are we are allowing the uh, digital credit and all digital services. So these are the sort of things like our mobile financial services and uh, payment service providers (PSPs) we call them. So they are they are actually uh, doing a very great great job means in the financial inclusion in our country because their success in in the pandemic the pandemic everyone everyone was losing their money but but the payment service providers their accounts are increasing 70 80% so they are their huge success and we we saw that during this pandemic the financial inclusion like in 2017 it was 50% in our country but if if we measure in 2020 after 20 we see that it's i think it would be around 70% 
So that would, that would be a great achievement in our country because of the pandemic, means the consequence, the good consequences of the pandemic as well. So thank you. There may be, there may be the, uh, the banks are doing good, the MFIs are doing good, and surely the PSPs, the mobile financial service providers, they are the driver actually. Thank you. Yes, all right. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so before I move to the next uh, question, we have a couple more. I would like just to ask the Saiko Turai. Saiko Turai is raising his hand. I would like to know if he has a question. And may I ask to the to events if he if you can allow him to talk, Saiko? Okay. Saiko, do you have any question? Okay, I move forward to the other question. So from Brenda Mwansa, uh, she's asking what is the main role of central bank in establishment of IGF initiatives? And yeah, I would like to, to go back to you uh, Iqbal, if you could provide us an overview of this question. So, so if we share the experience of the Central Bank of Bangladesh, what's the role of Central Bank? Central Bank is the regulatory authority and uh, supervisor of the financial sector. So to include more people in the financial arena and, and to make it uh, green. So the, the primary, primary role is making the infrastructure green. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that, is, that is actually the duty of the central bank so that it can give a, a congenial environment and infrastructure so that, uh, uh, so that the participants of the market can, uh, can take part in the, in the greening process, greening and in, in inclusion process. So central bank has to, sorry, central bank has to create the, create the regulatory environment and all, all sorts of formalities and the other participants also have to change their motive, change their behavioral perspective to be inclusive and to be green. Because being inclusive is responsible for financing, being green means we are responsible to the, our, our next generation as well. So central bank's part is to make the infrastructure so that the participants can become uh, green and they can perform their in financial inclusion uh, functions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iqbal. Uh, so next question, we have another one from Jorge Muncayo. And the question is, what is the biggest gap to change the traditional financial system to green products? Uh, I would like to, to go to Veronica for this question. Yeah. Laura, can you please repeat the question? Sorry, yes, I was on, yeah, okay. What is the biggest gap to change the traditional financial system to green products? So to a greener, to a greener financial sector. Yeah, okay. One would be from the demand side, from the demand side, if um, there is no demand from the real sector for green projects, um, that's one gap, right? Um, if uh, the real sector doesn't have that mindset to um, to uh, convert um, simple lending to green products, then that's one gap. From the supply side, um, the lack of infrastructure to green projects is another gap. So it's more from the real sector and at the same time from the supply of infrastructure. That could be the biggest gap from both sides. Thank you very much. So we have a couple of more questions but we would like to address uh, directly uh, with the speakers because we are rushing now with the time. So um, just let me thank you so, so much for your contribution. This is a very, very interesting panel and I think that we could spend one hour more just talking about these initiatives and the journeys and experiences and challenges. But yeah, unfortunately we are just running with the time. Thank you very much to, to you. And yeah, we are very delighted to have you here today. Thank you and we go back to Jane.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura. Okay. Thank you, Laura, and thank you to our uh, thank you to our esteemed panelists. That was a very interesting session, and there are definitely lots of insights and perspectives oh. to take note of. As the pandemic is still evolving, there's still a new, there's still a huge task ahead. And so, uh, by the way, if you have similar or other initiatives related to green recovery in your institution, please uh, feel free to share it with us. And to cap this wonderful discussion, we have prepared a Zoom poll. Uh, just to get an idea of uh, where re green recovery is in the network. So the poll is launched in your screen. We have four questions here. Please, uh, we'd like to request everyone to answer the poll. So the first question is, how relevant is greening the post COVID-19 to your institution? So very relevant, relevant, uh, low relevance, and then very low relevance. And the second question, how urgent is it for your institution to integrate IGF initiatives into the post COVID-19 recovery? Uh, is it very urgent, uh, urgent, little urgent, or um, it's not, urgent at all. And then for the third question, uh, this is a multiple choice. You can choose uh, as many as uh, relevant to your institution. What are the main challenges or potential challenges in greening the recovery post COVID-19? And the fourth one is, is your institution open or planning to integrate elements and green elements or IGF policies in your post COVID-19 recovery. Okay, we have 14 res responses. We have now 15. We have 19. Okay. We have 24 responses. Okay. It's still coming. Okay. And uh, so base, ah, there are still responses coming. Okay, so based on this, uh, on the poll, we see that uh, most of us see this. We have 44% that consider it relevant and then 36% very relevant. And when we look at the urgency, 54% thinks uh, it's, it's very urgent. And then 18% considers it uh, very urgent. And in terms of the challenges of the main challenges or potential ch challenges in greening the recovery, lack of resources is the first one. 57% says it's lack of resources and then lack of knowledge or awareness followed by lack of incentives. And yes, uh, we recognize also the lack of mandate. And then is, uh, are there plans to integrate and or integrate green elements or IGF uh, policies in the COVID-19? Uh, this is interesting because majority says yes. So in the next months, uh, we'll probably be talking more about this. So thank you very much for participating in the poll. And once again, like I've said, uh, please feel free to uh, share your initiatives or ideas 
uh, that your institution is doing in this uh, area. So now take, uh, take, we're now off to our closing session and I think we're a little bit over time now. So uh, we're, we're calling now Ms. Aban Hap, AFI's project lead digital finance champions for the closing remarks. So over to you, Aban. Thank you very much, uh, Jean. And uh, also let me thank um, the working group, the IGF working group for giving me an opportunity to participate um, and, and share uh, some highlights and opportunities related to AFI's COVID-19 policy response in light of the discussions that have taken place today. Um, just personally, it's been such a fantastic discussion. I've learned so much uh, since I'm still on a learning curve about uh, inclusive green finance. So really personally, a big thank you for, for letting me be here. Um, I think the overall closing uh, will be done much more, um, I think in a much better way by Audrey uh, following my own interventions. But what I would like to do is to just, um, you know, uh, take this conversation forward um, to talk a little bit about how AFI can support uh, members of this working group as well as the broader um, AFI network in integrating IGF interventions and policy responses in their uh, recovery response uh, going forward. And it's really, it was really interesting for me to, to see the results from the poll that uh, we just undertook. Um, and the two key challenges that emerged from that were around resources and knowledge. And I think those are exactly the areas in which AFI has positioned to support its members um, in their in greening their uh, recovery responses. Um, but just to kind of uh, give, uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone is familiar with the AFI COVID-19 policy response. This initiative was launched in March 2020 um, with the objective to ensure that AFI delivers systematically and effectively coordinated policy responses that help members mitigate the effects of COVID-19 on financial inclusion policy implementation. And the focus is not, was not just on uh, the immediate um, requirements in the emergency phase, but also position for the recovery phase. And to integrate and ensure that dimensions related to sustainable development goals like gender and inclusive green finance were uh, fully integrated into our um, AFI policy response interventions. Um, I think I will, I wanted to start with uh, highlighting the opportunities that we have in terms of uh, supporting members at the country level and then broadly at the network level, um, where I think uh, we could come in and provide assistance. And uh, I'm sure the members are familiar with AFI's ICI program. Um, and in, in the wake of the COVID-19, AFI has actually um, pivoted and adjusted its ICI process to and made certain changes that uh, allow us to expand the support uh, for our members in this um, strange time. Um, so the ICI program, in case you're not familiar with it, offers uh, two types of support. It offers um, uh, grant support for implementing policies, strategies, regulatory frameworks, and supervisory tools but it also provides technical support uh, through in-country mission, peer advisories, knowledge exchange, and hands-on technical assistance. In the, um, in the wake of, uh, in, since you know, the launch of the COVID-19 policy response, AFI has increased grant threshold for members uh, significantly to ensure that the resource needs that members have to adequately respond to the crisis um, is, is made available. We have also um, uh, changed the, the policy to allow up to two ICIs, so two grants or ICIs technical support could run simultaneously for members. So if a member already has a running uh, grant, they can they are still eligible to apply for, for another grant, especially related to COVID-19. And then also change the process, simplified it so we can expedite applications uh, during the COVID-19 um, crisis. Um, so I think uh, based on what I've heard um, in the discussions today, there are several opportunities uh, where, you know, this kind of support could enable members to, to initiate or to even strengthen their policy response and greening it. So, for example, I heard 
um, you know, interventions on how uh, technical support could align, uh, help central banks and financial sector regulators align their own initiatives with the broader government initiatives on climate change. So for example, Egypt's case, this is with Vision 2030. There could be similar initiatives uh, where you need interagency co cooperation. This could be used, uh, you know, ICI support could be used for that. We heard uh, several ideas around how you can green the stimulus packages that different countries are launching. So that's another area where this kind of support could be, could be uh, channeled. And then also in the innovation space, how can we support innovation and development of financial products uh, that reach the base of the pyramid, that reach the informal sector. So really driving innovation and uh, that helps us, uh, like we heard from Iqbal, not to just recover, but to rebuild a green, uh, green economy going forward. So I just wanted to highlight and reiterate the ICI support that is available under AFI's COVID-19 policy response. Um, can we go to the next slide? In addition to this more targeted uh, country level support, uh, I think um, AFI uh, has a very strong uh, program to support peer learning and policy guidance in this new area of you know, uh, recover, emergency response, recovery, and uh, inclusive green finance. And uh, there are several services that AFI already offers, and we've got a broad-based response which leverages on these to support members for peer learning, such as the technical webinar that we are part of today. In addition to that, uh, there are possibilities to uh, facilitate peer exchanges, um, as well as to document member experiences through case studies. And all this um, is tied to also the capacity building interventions. Um, like most organizations, uh, we, AFI has had an opportunity to, to uh, think about how we can leverage online um, platforms to expand our reach in terms of capacity building. So we are in the process of developing several AFI online uh, courses and e-modules which relate to crisis response and financial inclusion. And IGF is being, um, there are standalone, going to be standalone modules, but also um, I think IGF will be integrated in our modules on crisis response. And finally, uh, we hope that uh, the learnings and experiences of members during this crisis can start leading to policy guidelines um, and deep dives into emerging areas. And I certainly think the inclusive green uh, finance overlap with uh, crisis response is, uh, is going to be an interesting and developing area where um, you know, the members of this working group and the broader network can certainly contribute. So I think um, we welcome contributions uh, and participation from members to build, uh, build out all these areas and also interest in ICI uh, program and we hope that um, I think the, these different channels of support and peer learning can enable members to effectively respond to the challenges in their specific jurisdictions. I think one of the things which is um, which is very common, I mean, which common between um, inclusive green finance and COVID-19 is the the international nature of this uh, this this challenge. So climate change as well as COVID-19 seem to be challenges which no country can face on its own. So I think this is a real opportunity for uh, platforms and organizations like AFI to, to harness the, the, the potential that a collaboration uh, um, has and exchange of ideas has. So we welcome that. And uh, in case you have any questions or queries related to the COVID-19 policy response, please reach out to, to myself, to Laura, or to even your regional managers, and we'll be happy to, to facilitate and provide answers. Thank you very much, um, and back to you. Thank you very much, Aban, for that comprehensive presentation on the uh, potential and, and the support from the office side on the COVID response. And uh, we now call, uh, we call back Audrey, to give us the final words on the event. Back to you, Audrey. Uh, thank you, Jen, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we have come to the end of uh, our session, our webinar. 
Uh, I'm sure you agree with me that it has been a quite engaging, quite interesting. Uh, the participation was great. Uh, we have had from the experiences of three central banks, uh, that is Egypt, Bangladesh, and uh, the Philippines. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for taking time to, show, to share your experiences. It was actually most welcome. And um, to Joseph, uh, thank you for the broad overview that you shared with us from a technical point of view. Um, focusing on the impact of COVID-19 on the operations of uh, financial service providers with a particular focus on the microfinance uh, sector. It was quite insightful. And um, I'm sure you agree with me that uh, while yet we are not yet out of uh, the COVID-19 crisis, the discussions that we have had today, they help us prepare as well as uh, implement some of the initiatives that um, are, are responses to the current challenges that we are facing. So I would like to thank everyone for their efforts. Um, Aban, thank you again for sharing um, what uh, is available from the AFI in-country implementation support um, and policy guidance and uh, peer learning. And uh, we, we as member countries, we are ready to take advantage of um, the support that is available. And uh, to all the members, uh, your participation, in, like I indicated earlier, it was quite encouraging. Uh, there were a lot of questions, a lot of comments, a lot of sharing of uh, experiences and uh, some enthusiasm, uh, which, which I picked uh, during the course of uh, the sessions. Uh, it was uh, most welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe just to highlight to, to the working group members that uh, this is the last of our webinars uh, as a working group. But however, that's not the end of our work for this year. There's a lot that is still coming. So let's prepare ourselves um, to, to engage and participate in the initiatives that are still coming. Um, I've been I requested to also indicate that uh, there's going to be a Green Finance Global Conference uh, that is going to take place on the 3rd of December this year. Um, it's, it's not um, specifically organized by AFI, but um, we are invited to participate. I'm sure we are going to receive uh, further details through the management team in due course. Um, once again, I would like to thank the AFI management team for putting this together. I know it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but um, it has been very interesting, very encouraging. Uh, I was just looking at uh, our participation and I, I was really excited to note that uh, we are actually 67 in the room and uh, that, that really shows our our engagement and our interest in participating in this um, webinar as well as uh, this working group. Thank you very much. Our interpreters, we appreciate your effort. We appreciate your availability. Thank you so much. Otherwise, I would like to wish everybody um, a, a, a pleasant uh, day. Enjoy what is left of your day whether it's night, whether it's morning, whether it's afternoon, I wish you well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jen.